evening. Good, Good evening. evening. I guess everybody can hear me. People responded. I can hear you too. Hey, Kevin, what's your doctor's uh, phone number? Hold on, let me get that. Five five five. I want to. I want to make a report. I'm going to let them know you're out there doing jump ropes and push-ups and when you're not supposed to. So. <laughs> Did you see me? <laughs> <laughs> the, the way the world is now, I always see you. So. That's true. Ooh, that's but, uh, that makes that me is feel creepy. really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um... I, I was just talking to my wife yesterday. Everything uh, seems to have healed quite nicely and, and rapidly. I could, I could, I forget I even had surgery. So I, I that's good. no complaints about that at all. The uh, doctor said they did it with a robot, so it should heal fast. And it uh, seems like he was right. He was right. We're going base jumping tomorrow. No, I'm kidding. Nice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right. So we have, how many of us are there? About nine. That's a good deal. It is after seven o'clock. I've got everything going right here. It's great to see all of you. As usual, I'm going to give a little spiel here in a second. But as usual, if you have, uh, this, this is y'all's show. This is, this is where you get to share um, either comments or questions, this is here so you guys can have an input. I, I hope to one day get to the point where when we have these, I don't do any talking. I would like some cross questions back and forth to like where you guys are asking each other's questions and things like that. That'd be kind of fun. Um, so get your questions and comments ready. If you have a comment, type all caps comment and uh, then brief description of what your comment is. And then if you have a question, type all caps question into the chat box and then a brief description of what your question is. And uh, we'll go through those one at a time and I'll ask people to unmute as they go. In the last session we had on Sunday, we were, uh, we were in Acts and we looked at Acts chapter 2. And the passage we covered is Acts chapter 2 starting in verse 2 through about verse 4 or 5. I guess I'll read through verse 5. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, like other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So that's the, that's the passage that we covered and what I want to emphasize, and I think I emphasized this last Sunday, and I want to emphasize it again, is um, there is a tendency in modern Christianity to try to yank from the Bible things into the modern day rapidly, okay? What I want to do is separate, separate your Bible reading and study from, from everything that's going on today. I was just having a conversation a couple days ago where basically I described here's here's what I feel is happening in the world there is a bunch of stuff going on and when I say a bunch of stuff I mean anything anything that's going on from people buying and selling to people playing baseball to uh, making Lincoln commercials I mean whatever is going on there is just a bunch of stuff going on people joining clubs not joining clubs people running funeral homes uh, there's just a bunch of stuff going on and some of that stuff is just like all the other stuff, but it has Christian labels on it. You understand what I'm saying? And we cannot be, conf we need to distinguish the thing. <laughs> Don't be confused that just because something has Christian labels and iconography, that it necessarily has anything to do with the Bible. Because mm -hmm. it might, it might not. So what we're going to read, what we're trying to do when we, when we read and study the Bible and when we practice our distributed cognition here, is we're trying to read the Bible as uh, using first principles of thinking and sense making as if there is nothing today that we could compare it to and we want to see it as freshly as possible. We're not trying to refute. We're not trying to confirm. 
anything that is happening today. We're just trying to see what the text says. And in a narrative like this, we just understand it as a narrative event that happened, which does not necessarily affect us in any way. Now, we know that it does because all of scripture has some kind of application for today, but our first reading is going to be as if it doesn't. And then we dig into it and then we start, we're going to extrapolate application after we get observation and interpretation locked down fairly well. All right, is uh, everybody tracking on that? I think everybody's tracking on that. Check. All right, good deal. And I think we have a question about Peter's sermon and the prophet Joel from James Reach Out. So I will ask you, James, to unmute. <clears throat> All right, thank you. First of all, I just want to say, uh, you know what you're asking us to do, Mr. Thompson, is very difficult. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> It's super hard, man. It's like, because you learn all this stuff, you got all these ideas and stuff in your mind, and you hear all these, you know, uh, sermons and commentaries and stuff you read from the Bible, and you want to bring it all in. And it's like, to not do that, it's like, super hard to do. It's tough, yep. Okay, so my question uh, was on, um, I wrote it on the YouTube channel, and I, I wrote it down again here. Why did Peter stand up? Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about Acts chapter 2, verse 16. 16, yeah. So it was interesting to me because I was because we've been talking a lot about tongues lately, and and then uh, Peter stands up and he and he and he tells them, uh, you know, these these men are not drunken as you suppose. He yep. said, "It is but the third hour of the day." But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and he goes on to to, to read it, and it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Uh -huh. Now, I'll stop there, but I was thinking, if I was one of the, the people who came to, to hear what was going on, and then P Peter started saying this, I would still be wondering in my mind, okay, well, what about the tongues? Because it doesn't mention anything about tongues in, in Joel here, the prophet Joel. So my question is, why not? And is it... <laughs> Is Joel possibly, um, I mean, is tongues possibly tied into prophecy somehow? I don't know. That's just some questions that were going on in my mind about, about that. No, so these are, these are great, great questions. Such a great question. All right. And let's do the reverse of what you just said. What you just said, okay, tongues is happening in Acts 2, but you don't see it back in Joel. Let's look at what's happening in Joel that isn't happening in Acts 2. Look at verse 18 in Acts chapter 2, verse 18. And all my servants, all my handmaids, I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Okay, so this could be what's happening in Acts 2 because the, it, either the 120 or the 12, and I think that gets into Scott's question next, <laughs> they, they are speaking to people and they're telling them. And later on, we find that, they, you know, they all do tell us the wonderful works of God. So they could be prophesying and it's prophesying in tongues. So that could be, but look at verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great notable day of the Lord come. And this shall come to pass that whatsoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in Joel, it says, shall be delivered, not saved. And the idea of you, when we say saved, we think of saved in a Christian sense of being saved from sin, saved from hell, stuff like that. But sometimes in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, the word that shows up as saved in the New Testament is the word delivered in the Old Testament. And it's like someone helps them escape from like a military conqueror or something like that, or a pestilence or some kind of natural disaster. Um, so let me tell you, uh, so first of all, yeah, there is a decoupling of Acts 2 and Joel 2. And I'll tell you why I think that is. And then, uh, and then uh, we'll distribute cognitive, cognitive cognition it and see what you guys think of this. If you were to look in Acts 116, now I'll push and pause and look at, it's easy to remember because you can look at Acts 116 and Acts 216. In Acts 116, Peter's talking, he says, men and brethren, this scripture must needs been fulfilled. What, what scripture? He doesn't, he doesn't, you know, he's, what is he holding one up? Is he holding up a scroll? 
or is he referring to what's happening at the time? He says, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Okay, so he, the word this is a reference to the scripture that he's about to quote. Okay, now go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 16. When he says this, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. My understanding of this, and, and this is with the help of some other people, so I just, I just asked you guys not to consider other people. <laughs> Shame on me. Is that the word this in verse 16 is just a reference to the text he's about to use. In other words, but what, I'm, but what I'm saying, but what I'm about to tell you comes from the prophet Joel. Does that make sense? In other words, uh, like I, I knew a preacher, his name was uh, David Spurgeon, not Charles Spurgeon, but David Spurgeon, a guy who's still alive. And he'll tell you to turn to a passage of scripture and he'll say, okay, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, the, the word of God says this, and then he starts reading. And I think that that is how Peter is using the word this here. I think he has something that he's saying and what he's about to quote, he's like, imagine him holding up a scroll if he's not quoting, he's about to read. He's like, yeah, yeah, these guys aren't drunk, but don't worry. But look here, what I'm about to read, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he's about to tell them, he's basically about to preach a sermon and he's telling them where he's getting his text from. So I don't necessarily think that he's saying what's happening in Acts 2 is what Joel prophesied, but that what Peter's about to say is based on Joel chapter 2. Does that make sense? All right, you're, you're, you're muted, James. Yeah, yeah, kind of. It's, it definitely gives me some thoughts, something to think about. So either Peter's misguided or that's what's going on because... There, you're right. There's definitely a de decoupling here. What happens in Acts 2 is not described in Joel, and what's described in Joel is not happening in Acts 2. Now, that being said, I want to show you something in Joel. If we go to Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. Uh, actually, I'm trying to find a specific phrase in Joel 2. Um, because this gets used. If, I'm trying to, I'm doing a little quick search for it real quick. Well, that ain't happening. And there we go. Joel 2, okay. If you were to look at Joel 2.28, I'm going to go to Joel 2.28. And if you got your Bible open, go to Joel 2.28. This is what it looks like when, um, this is where Peter starts to, this is the text that he's reading, okay? Joel 2, 28, and it shall come to pass, and I'm going to read through verse 32, that I will pour out my spirit, it will come to pass afterward, and I will, okay, after what? And you shall know that I am the Lord thy God. So this, there's a great army, and you shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God. That's verse 26, I'm sorry, verse 26. So there's a great army which is going to be sent among them. Verse 25, you shall eat in plenty and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dwelt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. Now that sounds kind of like restoration. That is some restoration language for sure. What a lot of people today would call the millennium. All right, this is post second coming kind of stuff. And it shall come to pass afterward. After what? After that takes place. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters and shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions also upon the servants and handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke, sun shall be turned into darkness, moon and blood. Now it sounds like some revelation stuff before the great, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So there was some kind of restoration of Israel where the Lord is king again. And then like kind of like Ezekiel twenty thirty five kind of stuff, maybe Revelation chapter 12 kind of stuff. And then uh, the great and terrible day of the Lord, that's Revelation 19. That is the second advent when Christ comes to stomp everybody with a sword coming out of his mouth. It's going to kill everybody. 
And it shall come to pass, verse 32, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now, this gets back into what we, were, we had been talking about before, where it's possible that if Israel would have received her Messiah, either before or after the crucifixion, that Christ would have come back right then, and all the second advent things would have happened right then. So maybe Peter is selecting this passage in order to prepare them for the end times things, which are at hand. Because if you look in like Acts chapter 3, he definitely thinks the Lord's coming back in 15 minutes, the way he talks. Now, that's that. Um, so I would separate Joel 2. I would use Joel, when, when Peter says, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, take that as Peter identifying where he's getting his text from. Instead of, this is found in Psalm 2. This is found in Jeremiah 15. He, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. What he's about to preach on is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, not necessarily what's happening at that moment. But it could be, if Israel would have received her Messiah, that this stuff could have happened within, you know, minutes, days, or weeks of what he said. Now, if we are to back up in Joel, if you have your Bible open, just a little bit, say, in uh, verse 23 verse 22 be not afraid ye beasts of the field for the pleasures of wilderness do spring for the tree beareth her fruit and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength now fig tree is a picture of israel for reasons i don't want to take the time to get into here and um i'm operating off that assumption even if some people consider it to be un invalidated so that that's identified up front Verse 23, be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month, and the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. Let me tell you how this gets used. There are, if you were to Google right now something called latter rain ministries, you would come up with all kinds of different ministries uh, associated with this phrase latter rain all right now the way that is used is this you have tongue speaking being take being talked about in the book of acts and then for a lot of church history you don't like whatever it has whatever started happening in in 1904 you don't see any of that now there are people talking about something in tongues in some parts of church history but it's very sparse fair few between but this whole as Sousa Street Assembly stuff that started in 1904, you don't see that anywhere in church history. So there, the explanation for it, what those people did is they go into Joel and they see this early and latter rain. They say, well, this is symbolic language. It's figurative. And the early rain is the tongue speaking in Acts 2, and the latter rain is the tongue speaking ever since 1904. It's kind of how they explain that. Well, <laughs> what the... Notice they have to allegorize and use figurative language to do that. What the former rain and latter rain really is, and this may knock your socks off, it's rain. It's, it's rain. <laughs> rain. That's all it is. When um, Elijah is a precursor of what's going to happen in the second half of tribulation period, where there's going to be three and a half years of drought, and when Elijah was the prophet with Rahab and all that, um, not Rahab, Jezebel, different, very different. <laughs> there was three and a half years of no rain, three and a half year drought, okay, which is why it's a big deal that they're pouring all this water on, on Mount Carmel up there when they're doing the competition of the gods up there. Um, at the end, and you see this drought talked about again when in the book of James, when they're talking about basically the future the tribulation period is going to be drought again in the book of james for three and a half years that gets mentioned again and then you see this kind of thing happening again and i think hebrew six and a few other places at the end of that three and a half year period during the what is called the like what i think jesus calls there shall be great tribulation it's going to be a 42 month period um after the abomination of desolation where there's during that time is also going to be a drought it's going to be no rain and very scarce food. And at the end of that, in the Jewish planting and harvesting seasons, they have the early rain, which helps the growth, and then the latter rain right before the, uh, right before the harvest. So what's, 
basically there's a lot of prophecies that read just like Joel 2.23. And the idea is this, is that you're going to go all this time with no rain. And then all of a sudden, miraculously, the Lord for his people will provide um, miraculously, you will get all the growth of the entire season from early and latter rain coming all at the same time. So this is, this is basically a speaking of restoration of literal physical crops with rain. It is, it is not figurative language about anything spiritual necessarily happening. It's just rain. <laughs> hard, hard for some people to get that, but the Bible really is a rather simple book. All right, I may have gone off too much off the deep end. No, that's okay. Uh, yeah, so from what I heard, you, from what I hear you saying, it, it could be um, a, like a two-part deal. Like this is what you guys are seeing, but it wasn't the full prophecy because we see that it's talking about apparently uh, future things as well. Yeah, it definitely could be that. So say, say in Acts three and four and five, when James and John get they go before the council and they get whipped and stuff if the council would have received them instead, that could have triggered all this to start happening. Yeah, if I'm, if I'm looking at you like uh, you're crazy, it's, it's based on Acts chapter 17, verse uh, 11. It says, they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to <laughs> see whether these things so. <laughs> all right, thank you yeah, guys. Absolutely, that's the way to do it. Um, I always tell people, don't take my word for it, study, study it out yourself. And if you come to study it out and find that I'm wrong, good on you. Okay. The idea is that, yeah. By the way, that's a great verse for uh, when, uh, when a Calvinist asks you, why do some people get saved and why others don't? I, I just put Acts 17, 11 back on them. Like, well, and, and point out that they don't believe until verse 12. Because they'll try to argue that they're already saved. I'm like, nope, look at verse 12. They, therefore, many of them believed. So they don't believe till after that. That's kind of a side note. All right. Uh, I'm going back to Acts 2 in my Bible. And Scott Long has a question. I'm going to ask you to unmute. He says, was the Holy Ghost given to the 12 only or everyone? Yeah, and I have some uh, add-on to that since... Uh, James, you uh, brought up a question that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I, as, aside from from what uh, uh, I originally asked, uh, it it seems to me like uh, when uh, Peter stands up and said, "But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel," uh -huh. it seems to me like he's talking about. Uh, these folks that uh, the audience seems to think are drunken. And I think that they have uh, obviously received the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that those are uh, the, uh, the empowerment and the signs that the Jews need to... Uh, do their work, which is to uh, uh, try to usher in the kingdom. I don't think the kingdom's been withdrawn at this point. I think. Yeah, I don't is, think it is either. I think it's still on the table. This is an empowerment uh, for that. So let me and, pause you just for a second there and say that if you were to do like a Venn diagram, it'd be kind of interesting to do like a Venn diagram of everything that is, you know, a Venn diagram is where you have like overlapping circles. Yeah. where you have everything that's mentioned in Joel 2 and everything that's mentioned, everything that's happening in Acts 2, and then show what's in just one, and then sh have a little section in the center where they overlap what's counted, covered in both of them. Mm -hmm. So poured out my spirit on my handmaidens and young men, okay, that would be in both of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's, that's a good point there. Now, the, uh, the other thing that I noticed is, in verse 17, he says, in the last days. And in, in your chart, uh, you, you showed two timelines, one with uh, grace and one without grace. It seemed to me like they were not aware because it had not been revealed that, uh, that grace had started. Well, I've... Even, 
Yeah, I'd be a thing to call call a certain time period grace, but yeah, I'm following you. Okay. And and so I think that uh, that timeline that just showed the Jews going directly toward uh, uh, Jacob's 70th week was, uh, was what they were expecting. Yeah. They were expecting the the kingdom and Jacob's trouble to be right around the corner. Right, right. So when that, when uh, Peter is talking right around here, Acts 1, I think that if they were to extrapolate a timeline of what they expect to happen, it would look something like the bottom timeline, basically yes. our timeline, but no church age, what we call the church age. Right, right. So that that's why I think where that one Peter is is talking about these people that appear to be drunk, and he's saying that's not what this is. This is what Joel spoke about. Yeah, which, which is kind of the the precursor to the last days. But I'm just exploring this like you guys. But I I this is the way I see it. Right yeah, at the absolutely. Moment. Yeah. That's a, that's a good perspective. Now, another that's, thing that I, yeah. What I'm was, you said two things at the beginning. What was the other one? Uh, well, the, the, the two things that I think the spirit is for in this, uh, in this interchange are, uh, one empowerment for the work that they have to do. Uh huh. And the second is for signs to the Jews. Right, because signs, it signs. Seems like, it seems like a, a consistent thread is that uh, even Peter, when he's experientially finding out that, hey, the Gentiles can be saved just like we are. Right, that participatory sp- knowing that he gets, yep. Exactly. And so I'm, I'm thinking that... that uh, that those signs are uh, an, another thing that demonstrates to these people that uh, uh, they do have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, um, I, th- I, think, I think you're dead on with that. There is a passage in 1 Corinthians one twenty two that says Jews require a sign. Yes. And that's not just a, a loose statement thrown out there. If you follow the the history of the nation of Israel, look how they started as a nation. When they went from tribes to being a nation is at the time of Moses. And Mm -hmm. when Moses is identified as the leader, what identifies him as the leader is God sends him with signs to prove who he is. He's like, okay, here's the deal, man. You're going to pour this water out. It's going to turn to blood. You do that right in front of them. You're going to throw your staff down. It's going to turn into a serpent. You know, stick your hand in your bosom and pull it out. It's going to be with leprosy and you pull it back in. It's going to be healed again. So he sent them with these signs. So that set the precedent ever since then, when God sends somebody to the Jews to do something, they're looking for some kind of sign confirmations like that. And, and so, yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. That is the, that's why Jews require a sign because God has always provided them with signs. And mm-hmm. here again, these like um, Paul said, the signs of an apostle were given to me signs. There are certain, certain signs were performed among the people. The signs are because Jews require a sign. Absolutely. And we even see uh, Moses' face glowing after he right, comes to right. So back to my original question. There we go. <laughs> Was it just the 12 that got the Holy Spirit, or was it everybody present? I, I'm a little confused about the, the wording in the first part of this chapter. So um, let's do this together, because it seems like, it seems like I'm thinking of a passage somewhere else in the book of Acts where it's attributed to the 12, but I can't remember where it is. Um, so, I mean, the closest I can come to is in verse four, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, but who does all refer to? 
right. everybody present or just the apostles. Yeah, I have. I know I have in my notes. This kills me when this happens. Mm. I know I have in my notes some kind of reference to where somewhere else is just the twelve. Just the twelve, but yeah. I can't. I can't remember the reference that's associated with that note off the top of my mm. head. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, part of me thinks about Acts eleven, maybe Acts fifteen. Um, as on us at the beginning. Roberta, did you know where you you found that information? No, but I just read it this past week. Huh. And I'm sorry, I didn't know I was not muted. Oh. No, you're good. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, um, we might have to put that one down as is after work to look that up because it, but that is a good question though, because it's not, if we were to back up and oh, I just went, where'd I go? I'm, it took me back to the book of John. I scrolled too far. If we're in Acts chapter one, verse 14, we see that there's about 120 people there in the upper room. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when they came in, they went into an upper room, verse 13, where abode Peter and James and da da da, and, go, and they continue all with one accord with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up. And in those days, so there's like, you know, they're not just, it's not just one like meal. There's 10 days there where, they, where they're sitting around. Mm -hmm. The number of the names together were about 120. So there's 120 people there. And if we keep going through all the Judas replacement stuff, uh, he was numbered with the 11 in the house where they're all sitting. Yeah, I'm, I'm I, with Roberta. I remember seeing a passage somewhere else in the book of Acts where it's attributed to the 12, but I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head where that is. But this brings up something else. This will now be on our salience landscape. So when you are reading the book of Acts and looking now, whether or not it was the 12 or all 120 will should stand out to us next time we see it. Mm -hmm. mm, so, and they were, they were all filled with the Holy ghost. And so, yeah, that is that all referring to just the 12 or all 120 or the elect. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Kevin, I was going to say we, we definitely uh, know for sure that it was a 12 because in yep. Acts 4 through 5, it says you, uh, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So we know that for sure. Yeah, it was at least the 12. It was at least, was at least 12. <laughs> but was it also some of the other 120 or not? I'm not sure. Well, that's frustrating. It is frustrating. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, let's put that on there. Let's table that and try to see if we can find it. But that's a good question, Scott. Um, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a good question. And we'll uh, put that on our salience landscape. I'll look through my notes and see if I can find where that reference is. And then maybe we'll find out that that note was wrong. I don't know. That'd be, that'd be good too. That's a good question though. It's good because we don't know the answer. <laughs> um, it looks like Roberta's question is kind of related. Let's it is, and it verse. dovetails onto that. I, uh, it's a sequence question to me, and I was reading Ruckman this week, which oh, actually you made dog. it. I know, I know, I'm a, I'm a heathen. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm also a dispensationalist. Oh, uh, <laughs> he said something about noise de broad that made me really think about what was happening here, because I was under the impression that all this time, all the 120 were there. But in chapter one, it sounds like just the 12 were together. And in 2-1 and 2-2, it, sound, it says that they were all in one place and one accord. And were they talking about just the 12 at that point? And then the Holy Spirit came on them and the mighty wind and that noise that was noised abroad is what brought everybody rushing in. And that's why it dovetails with what Scott says because they, they weren't 
saved at that point or hadn't been converted. And I would think that it would have just been the 12 that had the Holy Spirit. But um, I was just surprised because all this time I was thinking 120 people at least were all there together. And they, it doesn't sound like they really were until they heard all the ruckus. So what, what makes you sound... Okay, the 120 are mentioned back in 114. Um, that's where we get the number 120 from. Oh, okay. But that's a different hundred, a different number than so, what shows up in the upper room? Because it sounds like in verse 5, there were a bunch of people living there in Jerusalem, and when it was noised abroad, they came together. So it sounds like they heard all this, and so then a bunch of people came. Imagine, so imagine like... Um, Okay, so if you go to 113 and they were all come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew. And so list all the 12 apostles. And then these all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And then in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about 120. So when Jesus okay, so they ascends were up into heaven, he ascends up into heaven. Pentecost is 10 days later. Okay. So what happens and and what's happening at Pentecost, imagine um it's kind of commercialized, if you will. Imagine, you know, I I just moved from New Orleans to Baton Rouge recently. I lived in New Orleans for about five years, and there are constantly like jazz fest and voodoo fest and Mardi Gras, all kinds of things going on. And it's a very it's a very uh touristy hospitality centric kind of culture that's going on because people are always coming from out of town. So in Jerusalem, you have these three feast periods a year where all the males are supposed to come present themselves. So three times a year, everyone's coming to Jerusalem. So it, so three times a year, if you are a, huh, a hotel owner or something like that, or you're selling food or trinkets or prayer beads or whatever, you know, that that's your black Friday. That's when everybody's going to come from everywhere and buy your stuff. And so everyone's in town and there's all this marketing stuff going around. Everybody's there for the um, celebrating the feast and everything, but it's just a, it's just a, the place is probably just a madhouse with markets and selling and people on the streets and going everywhere. Just like, just like a packed out, uh, you know, Mardi Gras thing in New Orleans or something like that. And so when this starts happening, they're in the upper room. They, they've got a place there in Jerusalem, too, because everyone's there temporarily, you know, just for a couple of weeks or so during the feast time. And they might have stayed, since it's only 50 days and you have to travel so far, they might have just stayed from the spring feast till Pentecost. So everyone's lodging there temporarily. And they're from all over the place. And this happens in the upper room. And then when it says, and when it was noised abroad, I'm thinking that, the 120 are in that upper room together. And then when it's noised abroad, it, you know, these 120 people, they're, they're moving in, they're getting up and going to the bathroom and leaving and going and buying stuff and talking people into the market. And this it starts to bleed out and starts to get to these people okay. who are out there on the street, busying themselves with all the feast, you know, stuff. And then, and then when people start to hear what's happening, then they start to gather in the street and you can imagine like a, like a throng of people and then they would come out and, and talk to the throng. Okay. So it was almost like something that gathered them together. The last time, the, so we get the 120 from verse 14. They're all in the upper room there. It seems like maybe it's like a big uh, banquet kind of room someplace. And they gave forth their lots, and, and he was numbered with the 11. Verse 26, 126, he's numbered with the 11 right. apostles. So you have the, the 12 mentioned there. So they did that choosing among the 120. I mean, the, the 120 were there when they were doing this? I, that's how I see it. That's, okay. that's what I envision. Okay. Um, you know, it's not, always, it's not always clear exactly what... <laughs> writer had in mind i i think there's all 120 there and they okay. pick matthias in front of everybody that's that's how i envision it and uh so when when this happens i we know like uh somebody said at least the 12 are doing it but are, are all 120 maybe they are maybe they aren't i don't know i don't know if it i don't know what impact it has if they are or aren't um yeah that's uh 
Yeah, I'm gonna let you elaborate some more, Roberta. I just no, that that was time. it. I was just trying to figure out who was there and if they all had received the Holy Spirit at that point, um, because the Holy Spirit fell on them right at the very beginning. Yeah, in 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 verse three. Yeah, but I got the impression that some of them were not necessarily believers, but they had been brought into the throng because of all the, the noise abroad. Stuff. Yeah, I think that's attracting the crowd from out in the markets in the street as the 120, maybe. So if all 120 are speaking in tongues, they're all there participating in all that stuff too. And they, and now you hear these Galileans are all speaking in and all these other languages, as far as the other people are concerned, that's going to attract the attention. They all start to gather to see what's going on. That's kind of how, you know, okay. I'm trying to piece it together in my head too. Well, trying um, to view it as Theophilus, it makes it kind of tough because it's not really clear to me. But <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. If you're trying to nail it down exactly, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it's like Luke is kind of assuming, you know, what's going on in a lot of cases where, they're, the assumptions are unvalidated for sure. But identifying what you don't know is also part of biblical interpretation. I think Lord Melvin has a comment. My cat. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cares, buddy. All right. Um, let's go to Joe, does Isaiah 28, 11 relate to tongues and acts for stammering lips and another tongue? Will he speak to this people? Uh, Joe. Yeah, well, that verse is in a, a chapter. There's a context there. Of course, it's Old Testament. Um, and in the context, Ephraim is mentioned, but it, it seems there's some prophecy in that chapter too. So uh, I just... I really don't have a lot to say about it. I just wanted to to hear uh, what anyone else might have to say about it. I'll, I'll give you my knee-jerk reaction intuitional statement real quick, if you don't mind. Now, I'm trying to pull up my... Uh, yeah. Well, in, the context mentions the Word of God being line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little right. and there a little. Yeah. Go ahead. So... What I think is happening here is um, Isaiah is a pre-exilic prophet. And what that, all that means, that's a 50 cent word, which means pre-exile before Nebuchadnezzar comes and drags them all off into Babylon. Now the Hebrews speak Hebrew. They do not speak Farsi or Arabic or whatever else these other crazy people speak, uh, Persian. They don't speak that. So when they get pulled captive, their God is dealing with them through people that don't speak their language with a stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. And then you could extrapolate that out if you were to go to, say, um, Romans chapter 10, verse 19, when Paul is explaining Romand, Romans, when Paul's explaining to the Jews how he's uh, turning over to the Gentiles and he's hardening the Jews and blinding the Jews, turning over to the Gentiles, Romans 10, 19, Paul says, but did not Israel know? But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them which are no people and by a foolish nation will I anger you. And He's applying that, that comes out of Deuteronomy 32, 21, but he's applying that to what's happening right now. God is hardening and blinding the Jews, and he's using a bunch of Gentiles that speak Greek and Latin and all these other languages, and he's, he's provoking Israel to jealousy. They're getting upset about that. Hey, I thought we were God's chosen people. What's up with you using all these other people? And now you turn it around, now Christians speaking anything but Hebrew, are turning around and sending missionaries into Israel to try to win people to Jesus Christ. So they, they are being spoken to by another tongue. In other words, it's like, uh, yeah, you're no, longer, you're no longer God's people temporarily. 
you know, the gifts and calling of God without repentance. And that phrase is with respect. The context of that is Israel being God's chosen people. So I think, I think this has to do with them being carried off into exile and with the fact that if you extrapolate it out into the ultimate prophecy, into the, into the church age, you have a bunch of Gentiles speaking anything but Hebrew telling Israel about their own Messiah, which has got to be infuriating if you put yourself in their shoes, <laughs> you know? Imagine a bunch of Muslims come try to tell you stuff about Christianity that you thought you knew, but they know it better than you. Yeah, and, and you, know? you actually crucified him too. Yeah, they crucified him. I was planning on doing a video speaking about that a little bit, that and repentance. I'm going back to Acts 2, and uh, let's see what's next here. Um, Scott, Acts 2-2, two, two, house meaning Peter's perspective. I'm going to, is it uh, this Scott? Not Scott Long. I'm going to ask you to unmute, Scott, if you want to talk about your uh, right, well, question there, your comment. Don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but, um, I, you know, I've always wondered, what, you know, what this was, you know, what the, what was happening here, what the timeline was, and I really never cared that much about it because it's like, well, it's not that important. But from the perspective, if there's not a lot of detail given, then it might be that um, – then it would have to be the most simple, obvious thing, or that would be at least one of the scenarios. And then also Peter's perspective is, you know, he's thinking that um, there's not going to be 2,000 years before Jesus comes again. Right. It's going to be kind of quick. And so then he pulls that Joel thing in to say that, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, profound things are going to happen, just like this is a profound thing that people are speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so, so here, so it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, so I think that kind of divides Acts chapter one from this. It's like, okay, now here a, a day, a few days in the future, the mm -hmm. people are gathered together. And it says a place. Well, in, in um, verse two, it says, um, and it filled all the house. And so at least now, listen, I'm not a Greek scholar, so I don't know. And so, you know, we got to take people's words for it. But Strong says that um, that word house or whatever the Greek word is for that, that it can also mean temple. Now, yeah. it's only used one time as temple. Well, it's, it's also used in the book of Jude, oikos. It's also used in the book of Jude to mean uh, like a body. could mean the, the residence of a, of a soul. So oikotirion could mean a body, a temple, a house. Yeah. Okay, so there probably more than just the 12 were there because probably the women were there too. And so that already makes more than 12. So, and it kind of seems like that there would be a lot of people. And so then it says, and then it, so then it says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. So if these guys are in a room and a sound comes from heaven, they're going to want to see, this is probably a pretty profound sound. So they're probably going to go outside to check it out. Yeah, they start sticking their head out the window, yeah. Well, but they, I would think that they, it was a big sound that they would have gone outside. Now, it wasn't lightning or raining or anything. So why wouldn't they go out the side to see what the sound was? So they go outside, um, it's hypothetical, right? But they go out, everybody goes outside, and then they see these, um, these um, uh, I don't know, glowing things that look kind of like cloven tongues and, and maybe like as fire, and it, you know, comes on each one of them. And so now these guys receive the Holy Spirit, and they're able to speak in tongues. Now the same sound, so then down in verse 6. Have you ever seen Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark? Which time? <laughs> No, this kind of, I mean, when you read verse 2 and 3, I've always kind of thought that these kind of things happen back to back. But what if the rushing mighty wind came down for 30 minutes, you know? And so people are like going outside and looking up and there's this thing happening, you know? Anyway, that's, uh, yeah. Okay, so then down in, in verse 6, it says, Now when this was noised abroad... That's King James, obviously. Um, but then there's a note there where it was, was in uh, present, it says sound occurred. So now when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. So then all these devout men who were in Jerusalem, that, you know, devout men are, I guess, um, wise, studied, spiritual guys, not fools probably, but they were serious people, um, 
uh, with relationship with God. Yeah, they would. They took it seriously enough to travel to Jerusalem like they were commanded to. Yeah. Right, right. And so then all these guys that are filled with the Holy Spirit now are speaking in different languages for all these people to hear. Mm -hmm. And so that's how maybe it could have happened. And it was all outside at this point because everybody's looking for this noise in heaven. Because if you're inside, if a noise comes from heaven, you know, you look up, well, it's not coming from the ceiling. You know, yeah, you know, I do think that some, I do think they made their cell, they made their way outside by the time verse six happens. Right. Yeah. And then, but then I kind of get that feeling speak, from it. And then all these people are saying, well, these guys are drunk. Well, that, you know, but if they were speaking truth, you know, mockers, you know, when they hear the truth, they're going to say, well, I don't believe that. And they may start make, making fun, which some of these guys did, but some of them are going to hear truth and they're going to recognize it as truth. Right. Yeah, yeah. Miraculous. I mean, 3,000 anyway. of them get saved. Or is it five? Right, exactly. Here? So you can't do that in a room. Yeah, 3,000. Yeah, 3,000 right. of them ex receive this. Yeah, so anyway, that was, that was, I guess, my insight. I really never thought about it or seen it that way before, but it may, seems to make a little more sense. Or one scenario, at least. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, yeah, I definitely agree with you. And that would make sense that the rushing mighty wind from heaven might be what got them out of their house. But it, it seems like they're all outside by the time verse 6 is happening. Right. For sure. And that's what drew all the multitude together so they could yep. hear this message. Yep, that, yep. That I, yeah, I definitely agree with that. That makes sense. Um... Yeah, that's James reach out. You don't have a all caps comment here, but I'm still gonna. Uh, if, if you would, uh, Kevin, skip over me, please. Let, give everyone else a chance first. Yeah, yeah, I'll go to everybody else. But it is it is something I thought of too. The Ephesians five eighteen, and in my studies over the past couple of weeks, I've noticed multiple times where the concept of the spirit and drunkenness are either compared or contrasted throughout Scripture, which is interesting. Um. Yeah, I think Keith, we'll go to Keith next. And I think he's talking about the same thing we were just talking about. Right. So, sorry, I'm, I am going to beat a dead horse. Let's and I'm going, to I'm going to untable Scott Long's uh, uh, idea here. So, um, I mean, first impression, it's interesting here. You know, I read through this chapter several times. And just by discussing, uh, discussing it, you know, brings new focus, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And because uh, initially, and it says, and it filled all the house. So um, obviously, pictures uh, have a lot of meaning. Um, obviously, uh, the uh, propositional knowing, as you keep bringing up a lot of times, there's a lot of information packed in pictures. And when a lot of people depict this, either they're in the house or they're out of the house. I think of, you know, dusty, sandy, adobes, very small. I don't know how you would get 120 inside a, a house, but. The other Scott, as he mentioned, that it could be interpreted as a uh, one time it's interpreted as a temple. So either this is a real big house or um, the 12 are in the room and where the other, uh, the remainder of the 120 are in and about other rooms or maybe outside. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking maybe it's like a banquet house. And like, like if you go to a hotel right now, they got banquet rooms. Well, they got like a huge room in an in a inn and maybe they had those where they could rent them like that. Right. Um, so maybe they all have rooms in the inn and there's a big banquet room that they're also renting out or something. I, I don't know. Yeah. Right. And then there, there's a, another thing that's coming up between the 12 and 120. Now in verses uh, two, five, I'm sorry, um, two, nine and two, 10 and two, 11, all these, these representatives from these nations here. So, if you look back up at two four, mm -hmm. and as I'm, I'm a <laughs> here's a new term for a sequentialist. So I'm an engineer by trade. So I like to see things very linear. So that's yeah. some of my assumptions and propositions I bring mm -hmm. when I uh, try to make myself aware of when I read scripture. Is the actual speaking of tongues a supernatural event? Or did they already have this ability and it's just the spirit gave them utterance to speak in that uh, other language that they already know how to speak. Now, having 16 nations represented, if you have 120, that's possible naturally. I'm just thinking of odds here. But if you have the original 12, I, I find it hard that the 12 would uh, 
uh, be naturalized in other languages right, that would right. communicate to all 16 uh, nations represented. But if you had 120 uh, where the spirit gave them utterance, then that could be possible. Or, you know, I'm looking at it from a naturalistic standpoint versus a supernaturalistic right. and standpoint. The, the piece of information that would also feed into that is by observation, at least a majority of them, verse seven appeared to be obviously Galileans by, you know how like in the United States, we can spot Northerners a mile off. (laughs) (laughs) Hey now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they're not all these which speak Galileans because they're up there in the North. I mean, they they could look at how they dress. They could see kind of how, you know, um, I'm going to, I'm going to watch what I say now. (laughs) <laughs> I might live in uh, Middle Tennessee, but I'm from Pennsylvania, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's it's just interesting this this conversation because I've read through this chapter numerous times and I never really gave it much thought. I always just assume it was the twelve uh, sitting in a room and it actually the you know the house was filled and then somehow somewhere they made their way outside because as you read through here. Um, as the multitude gathered together, they're confounded. Are they, are they coming up to the house and sticking their heads through the window, listening to these guys uh, speaking in their native tongue? Or it, like we've been talking about, are they coming outside somehow um, in, in that sense and uh, broadcasting the message that way? So yeah. just uh, my two cents there. Yeah, definitely attracting a crowd with whatever's going on. For sure. Yeah, it's good. Good observations for sure. Um Scott Waven, did you have something to add? I'm going to ask you to unmute. There you go. All right. Well, the thing is, is um, I think that the text implies that this was a miraculous thing. So can it, that se- it seems that you? way to me. Yeah, I do think it's right. good to consider that maybe it wasn't, but I, I don't think it would have been so crowd drawing if it was just people who happened to be multilingual. Yeah. Right. Well, they, yeah. They wouldn't have called them drunk. And then, it, then down here it says that um. So, so everybody assuming that this was something special, Peter then goes in to, to quote Joel and say, hey, this is not the only um, supernatural spiritual thing that's going to happen in the end days. And then he goes into the gospel here trying to get them to, uh, where is that? I will show wonders in heaven. You know, hey, this is not, this, we should be expecting this because it was prophesied by Joel. Then he said, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, was approved. So he's saying that, um, you know, everybody that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yep. Even of Israel, now he's going to tell them how they can be saved. It's Jesus that can save them. And, um, you know, he being delivered by the, de- the, the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God um, and all that. And so it's like now they have an opportunity to receive it. Right. And then that would close the whole idea of what was going on there. This evangelistic encounter. Yeah. I, I bring that up um, because uh, I know in a lot of the circles that I bump into, you either have people uh, trying to explain all the supernatural events away as naturalistic events, especially a lot with uh, Moses' miracles and, um, you know, the Red Sea parting, so on and so forth. Right, yeah. So just thought I'd point that out. I like it. Um, James said, all means all. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, all right. James, you want to do your question here? Um, uh, I just, I just speak on it real quick. Just, uh, I was listening to a, a commentary on by Chuck Missler on the book of Acts chapter two. And he was, he actually brought up a good cool point. He said, could it be that that mighty rushing wind was actually what drew the people when they're like, well, what the heck's going on? Kind of like when there's an earthquake, you know, like here, yeah. an earthquake three years ago. And then about six years ago, and then, and it was like three o'clock in the morning, but you go outside and everyone's out there with their flashlights, like looking around, like what's going on? Are you guys are all right. And so could it have been that that mighty rushing noise, uh, the noise that they actually heard brought them together. And then they heard them speaking the glories of God in their language. And they were like, Whoa. And that's when Peter starts to do what he did. Yeah. It was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. I don't know how you would hide that. And it certainly would attract attention for sure. Yeah. And then how long, and then, uh, a rushing mighty wind filled the house where they were sitting. What if that kept going for hours? 
You know, it doesn't say, I don't see it. It doesn't say it went for 10 minutes and stopped. Well, it could still be going. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. I mean, maybe that happened for there's a duration to that. Wow. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking also, you guys ever seen those videos of like the, uh, the Pentecostal churches when the Holy Spirit falls and people start running around crazy and start jumping over the pulpit and stuff? Maybe that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't just yeah. call anybody crazy, did you? They're actually pretty funny. I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying if they're right or wrong. I'm just saying it is kind of. <laughs> um, I should not say what I'm thinking right now. But you may get an inkling one day to um, Google such events where they have added uh, special effects from the game Mortal Kombat. <laughs> okay. Y'all never played Mortal Kombat? What kind of what generation is this? Get over here. That's right. Exactly right. <laughs> All right. Let's go to uh Juno Herrera for provoking Israel to jealousy. Yes. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, yes, sir. Okay, yeah. So uh Really, really discussing about uh, God provoking Israel to jealousy, yep. and uh, what what I can see there is God's faithfulness in His covenant with Israel, in that even we Gentiles are used by God to attract Israel. When when it says provoking them to jealousy, or when someone is jealous, say a man is jealous of his wife's office colleague, uh, something like that. Uh, that man's attention is drawn back, not just to the colleague, but also to his wife. It kind of makes me think that it draws him to his wife in a way that questions her loyalty or commitment, or maybe in in theological terms, covenant. Uh, so yeah, th that uh, I think the way that God deals with Israel's disobedience or hardness is that even we Gentiles are used by him to attract back Israel. Uh, by the way, when I saw drawn, it's not like the Calvinistic uh, drawing, drawing the elect. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I get you there. So you're saying it was a little choppy. The audio was a little choppy. So I'm going to try to restate what I think I heard you say. So like, um, say, uh, a husband and a wife are having a tough time of it if the husband sees the wife with another dude that might make him jealous and then reestablish his relationship with his wife back to where it should be is that is that kind of what you're saying yep 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 okay okay yeah yeah that makes sense like hey we used to be the chosen people what's uh <laughs> what's up with these guys what's up with these crazy gentiles when uh it's tempting to think of the Jews as God's chosen people like they're the only people being saved. But I think if you look at the Old Testament, that's not the story that you get. Uh, Abraham is told that you're, you're going to be a blessing to all people, all families, and all kindred of the earth. And then you have, like Jonah is sent to the Ninevites. And I think one of the problems of Israel when Jesus shows up to basically set things straight is that they had become so exclusivist. Whereas the, what they're supposed to be is basically the conduit of God's voice to all the other people. If you read the book of Joshua, for example, when they come out of Egypt, um, Rahab says, we're all scared to death. I'm paraphrasing. This is the message version. We're all scared to death because we all heard what happened in Egypt. And uh, we don't want that to happen here, you know, when that's what she tells the spies. We, everyone has heard what happened. So the point of Israel was for everybody to hear about Jehovah, not, not just Israel be saved, but everyone else hear about God through them. Um, and when they stopped doing that, um, God's like, okay, I'm going to use somebody else to reach people with. All right, that was the last comment that somebody said they had a comment. 
we have gone to 8.30 before. There's nothing saying that we have to. My original vision for this was to be one hour, but um, we'll definitely cut it off at 8.30. We got one more. Uh, we got Keith saying Isaiah 49.6, and he says, The light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob to restore and preserve Israel, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles. Right. That thou mayest be my salvation at the end of the earth. That's, yeah, that's absolutely right. Confirming um, what I was just saying. Way to be a good wingman there. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to go, we're going to give it about another minute or so. And if nobody else has a comment or a question, we'll, we'll wrap up tonight's session. Uh, hey, Kevin, do you, yeah. do you mind if I share an experience about drunk in the spirit? Th this should be fun. I may have to edit this out. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> I, I just want to share it with you guys because, like, um, I've never barked like a dog or mooed like a cow or anything like that, but I will share something. Well, with you me. don't really have the Holy Spirit then. <laughs> <laughs> that's possible. So here, here I was in, in Central California, a little town called Reedley, and I got invited to the Spanish church. It was a Spanish. It happened to be a Pentecostal church. I'm just going to say this. There is something about being in a church where everybody is serious. And what I mean by that is like, they're not there to play games. They're, they're really there to-, to They mean business. They mean business, yeah. And so we were worshiping the Lord. Long story short, after that, that meeting that I was there and worshiping the Lord with these people, we came out and they had little tamales and stuff outside. But I kid you not, I felt like I was about halfway drunk, at least one margarita in me. And so there was no, how do you know how that feels? <laughs> there was no drugs or alcohol involved, but I did feel like, like, and it was, it was really, it was, uh, I couldn't stop smiling either. It was like, I was so full of joy and it was a kind of a wobbly kind of thing. So I'm not sure if, I don't, I don't want to say that was, uh, what it is. Let me put it like that. Um, uh, but I just want to share that with you guys. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I would be interested, um, I'm planning on doing another video real soon dealing with sense making. And one of the things that's difficult about sense making is when our minds have been trained to think of things kind of scientifically, and that is objectively. In other words, the only things that we accept as true and real are the things which other people can verify through their five senses and duplicate and, and document and replicate the same way so that it can be observed and demonstrated by other people. But what that fails to account for is that there are some experiences that are subjective, that are purely subjective and therefore outside the realm of science as we know it, but no less real, okay? So when it comes to, and then there's the issue of causality versus correlation. So there could be a number of things if something happens um the two things might not necessarily be related like if the if the i think somebody quoted something recently where the number of the amount of cheese that had been sold one year rose in precise proportion to the amount of shark attacks that had happened that year you know <laughs> And if you could easily skew information like that to make it look like those are related or that one caused the other. And one of the key things you start doing when you start doing your sense making is separating causality from correlation. Just because two things happen at the same time or happen near each other or are associated or, or at the same event does not necessarily mean that one caused the other or that the other one is a result of the other one. Um, something Jonathan Haidt points out in his book is that going to a college football game where everyone's singing the fight song and everyone's doing the hand and arm signals or whatever to cheer the team on, that can be like a spiritual experience, even for a non-religious person. Um, I think that a lot of events like that are genuine and real, but I also think that it would be premature of any of us to try to say that it definitely was or definitely was not the Holy Spirit, you know, and try to build like doctrines off of it for some, or something, you know? Yeah, I would, I would totally agree with you. And that brings me to a, a concert I went up to here in Calistoga. It was a Christian rock concert. I think Caleb put it on, but in one of the booths, they had these rocker guys that were just like El Screamos, like, Rah! and so I'm sitting there listening to them. 
And when they're, I guess they were singing about Jesus. I couldn't really hear what they, the words they were saying. But to, to your point, their word for it, huh? to kind of pick, yeah, to kind of piggyback off what you're saying, what I did notice was I was getting really emotional. And I actually even started tearing up and crying a little bit. And I was just like, I could barely understand what they were saying, but it could have just been the loud music and the, the screaming. I'm not really sure, but anywho. Yeah, that's a very good point too. Um, I would encourage you to, now I'm going to say a name and I don't necessarily agree with everything that this guy says, but I would say it's very insightful to at least hear what he has to say. And it's a guy named Frank Garlock. And Frank Garlock, um, I think he's associated with some of the Bob Jones guys. If you've ever heard of Patch the Pirate or Ron Hamilton, it is his father-in-law. And um, he has some information on music and how music can be used to manipulate people's emotions. And then once you manipulate people's emotions, you, they, it makes them more in more of a susceptible frame of mind where they are less discerning. And so if you wanted to, you know, that old saying, people don't remember what you say, they remember how you make them feel. And so if you have something to say that you want people to accept, especially if you want them to put money in the offering plate or something like that, you need to make them feel a certain way. And if you have like a master musician to help you out doing that, that's a, and I only say that I, I used to kind of be a hard liner about certain kinds of music should and should not be associated with church or with Christians or things like that. But that, that gets kind of hairy at some point. And I would just encourage everybody to exercise discernment and be careful about how how what the relationship of music is to a message that purports to have propositional truths in it and then how that makes you feel about the or how that makes you feel and then how it makes you process that information either in a more or less astute way because it in other words listening to music certain music might make you worse of a information processor than you were just 10 minutes earlier, or it might make it better. Or I don't know, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so then can you, can you share the name of the person you mentioned so we can, his name know. is Frank Garlock. Now that Frank Garlock, it, he, he promotes a very, very conservative view of music and what churches should have and what Christians should have. I'm not necessarily saying that you have to follow his recommendations on all that, but at least hear out what he has to say about how music can affect you. All right. Uh, I think Keith has a comment regarding, um, let's go to, I think Joe has an experience and then we'll go to Keith and then we'll uh, wrap it up after that. So Joe and then Keith. Okay, hi. Uh, well, this is an experience. It's not mine, but I know a, a preacher told me this. <clears throat> that he said he told me that he really thought that the the laughter there was nothing to it. Uh, you know, where people fall down laughing and roll in the floor or whatever. But he said he uh, was on the stage with, uh, you know, kind of sitting there, and some other person was speaking, and this other person. <clears throat> was known for laughter or what some might call holy laughter and 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 this might call what me, laughter holy, holy. Oh, okay yeah yeah okay yeah. yeah but he told me that while he was sitting up there on the stage thinking there's nothing to it it happened to him i think i'm not sure he might have fallen out of his chair but he said it it happened to him and yeah, uh, i yeah. thought that was but but the same preacher told me that he saw another case in another service. I think he was the speaker there and some people were barking like dogs. And he seemed to, to tell me to think, he seemed to think that that was being faked. That even though he thought there was the real thing, he seemed to also think there, that so there is a counterfeit was uh, i guess discerning that what he was looking at was was fake i'm not you know i would i don't really want to get into this right now but i would be very curious about the edification value of barking <laughs> well <laughs> he, he never seemed to think that that was real but the he did think that the laughter was real because he said 
it happened to him when he did not even believe in it. Yeah, yeah. For what uh, it's worth. Haven't we all had laughing fits that uh, don't seem to go away? All right. So uh -huh. I, th I do think, um, did Joe, were you going to say something else? Well, I was just saying, yes, I did. I was at, having at work one time. We were, you know, going through some training. And there was, I just couldn't stop laughing. And there was a woman there and, uh, who, who also worked there and she couldn't stop laughing either. And it was, it was not a church service at all. It was just, and, and I, I didn't even know what was so funny, but we could just look at each other and fall over laughing, it seemed. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Laughter is contagious too. Uh, Jack Handy said, um, Dad always thought laughter was the best medicine, which is probably why some of us died of tuberculosis. That's supposed to be a joke. Is nobody else getting that? I think two people got that. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, Nick made a point uh, about uh, Daniel 3, 4 through 5. They use music to make people bow down to false gods in the book of Daniel. And I think Frank Garlock also mentions that as well. So Keith, uh, with regard to music, he's got a comment. Right, just, uh, just to concur what you said in terms of uh, being cautious on that and coming from an IFB church, there's at the end of the service, there's the uh, sappy invitation call music. Yep, yep. So on and so forth. And being in a service myself, um, I mean, if you play Carmina Barana, Carl's Orth, Carmina Barana, man, I'm ready to fix bayonets and just run out and start fighting with anybody. So, right. yeah. you know, um, so I'm aware of the, uh, you know, not to come off so much like a Spock as opposed to, um, who was the doctor that Spock always McCoy? fought with? It was McCoy, right? Because yeah. he was the, always oh. the emotional one and Spock was the cold and logical one all the time. So, yeah. <laughs> but it can be a powerful psychological weapon. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, if, uh, you know, some of the independent Baptist strains will tell you all Christian music all the time and all a certain kind of Christian music all the time. And, uh, well, I'm not, I think that there's different music for different purposes. And if you know what you're using it for, like if you know that you're going to go work out, you might have something that, edifies the flesh for it has a beat to it that gets your blood pumping you know but it might not be conducive to trying to prepare your spirit for a serious moments of contemplation on scripture you know so there's you know use you discernment and then several people are posting scriptures here with the uh, minstrels above i think joe you got one more comment about this or nick nick did you want to say a comment about your uh, daniel three passage no, and uh, Joe, do you want to make a comment about your Second Kings three passage? Oh yeah, I just read this recently, but uh, Elisha, I believe, called for a minstrel. He was asked to prophesy, and he said he wouldn't do it except for one person. I think it was a king of Judah, <clears throat> and he called for a minstrel. And then, when the minstrel played, then he prophesied. You know. I yeah. thought that was interesting in our context. Yeah, that would be another one of those things where you could try to extrapolate a doctrine out of that. Like, we can't get yeah. the spirit until, and then you'd have to have the right kind of instrument. <laughs> you know, who knows how far that would go. Well, I, I, I did, yeah. And I heard a World War II veteran in the Army comment on this he said there's something about music you get a band playing and soldiers will march off a cliff so music can be powerful and i suppose it could be powerful for good or not so good bad even right right and if i mean if you listen if you learn the um we teach the principles of music so you can protect yourself but in the wrong hands, the principles of music can be used to manipulate too, you know. But I I grew up in a, I spent a few years in a Christian church where 
the pastor was constantly preaching on Proverbs 7 and warning people about the 20 attributes of a harlot. Well, that's, that's probably good to know, but some of those young men took that information and they used it. So now they knew how to go spot easy women. <laughs> you know, you, you use, it depends on how it's like a weapon, you know, you can use it for good or you can use it for bad. So we want to, uh, yeah, you want to use that stuff for good. If you, if you have access to it, don't exploit it for personal gain. All right. Um, oh, Scott's got a question about rock music. Or a comment. Not a question. Um, so yeah, on comment. Vacation, on vacation with the family down at the um, Smoky Mountains, we went to a um, swap, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, a swap meet thing. You know, it's in a big building and everybody's got a booth set up. And yeah, there yeah, was yeah. Um, <clears throat> some evangelistic group that had books set out. So I bought this one about rock music. And um, I basically the message in there is that um, rock and roll music came from um, Africa, Egypt, namely, it's got a syncopated beat. And um, it actually, you know, creates a physical response in your body. Yep. And uh, I don't remember all the details, I'm gonna have to get that book out again and read more about it. But um, it made a lot of sense that my kids don't like that book at all. <laughs> and um that's a problem. Um, but number two is, is um, there's a video on YouTube called Why Modern Music is So Awful. And it's a young guy that did this like 20 minute video. And um, he's, um, it's, he's a wise young guy, I would say. And I, I mean, you know, he says um, um, the, the, the repetition, um, I, it's, just, it's very enlightening. I think it's, it helps uh, it helps to be discerning about what is really going on in music and how it affects people and why, you know, what the, what the um, elements are in it that are, can be dangerous. And then the thing is, is that a lot of this, a lot of Christian music, it's meant to stimulate the flesh, not, um, not, I would say to edify or to um, encourage, um, you know, uh, spiritual readiness and if you're going to go work out, like you said, hey, that's great. To, you know, you want to pound the flesh. But, you know, I, I, I called some of this stuff, you know, it's kind of like it's um, breeding music. I mean, it's meant to breeding, like breeding, oh. you know, like fornication. Yeah, yeah. Breed. God, you're tracking. Well, and, you know, I mean, and, and it's so why, why would you want to listen to that if it's just going to try to, you know, put you in a mood of, um, you know, um sinful behavior i don't get it and um but yet you know so many well i guess we're in the age of what the laodicean church and the philadelphian church right we've got the apostate church and and the uh philadelphia church is what church of the open door yeah no 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 but i mean it's um it's um oh the philadelphian church is the um Oh, wait, it's the good church. The the, the um, Philadelphia is one of the good ones. Yeah, right, right, right. So, the land is senior, yeah. so supposedly we're in an age right now where we've got you know the dual church, the apostate church, and then the the church that's um, you know, seeking the Lord. Yeah. Anyway, that was it. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like a lot of folks are having comments on here. Somebody said, uh, Joe's got comments about music's effect on plants, but I want to say, um what we've been talking about is acts two and the spirit and it's very easy to get confused about a physiological or a chemical or emotional response confused with a spiritual response now i think the spirit inside of a person is going to have an effect of John 16, 12 and 13, where the spirit guides to truth. So the spirit is going to have an, is going to give the person who has it an impulse toward that which is uh, with regard to God, with regard to virtue, with regard to right, with regard to 
what you should be aiming for in your life. If Paul's pressing toward the mark, so it'll be associated with that in a truthful way. And if you have a feeling that affects you in a certain way and that doesn't come with it, I would be very cautious about that. And you hear people all the time talk about, well, I really felt the spirit in that song service. And really, really, they felt of a lot of emotions during the key changes. That's really what they felt because they're not, they're not, they don't have any more guidance toward truth than they had before. They just had some feelings and you can be, I mean, if, (laughs) well, we could really go on and on about music, but just under, you know, in Hollywood, the music industry is worth billions of dollars. Think of Star Wars and Superman without the music. Think of Indiana Jones without the music. The music makes it. It is, you could say it's everything in a sense, you know, and if it did not affect your emotions and how you feel and how you take the information it wouldn't be worth so much while people are presenting narratives on screen like that. So it is, it is huge. It is huge. It cannot be underestimated. Or we're at 827. We're going to let Joe say, uh, huh. Joe has a comment about music's effects on plants. So let's, let's hear that. And then we'll do alibis and then we'll wrap it up. Well, okay. Well, it was years ago, I read something about, I believe it was the University of Wisconsin that did some research with plants and they played, believe it or not, I think it was corn and they played rock music and they yeah. played Beethoven or Vivaldi, you know. Yeah, classic. yeah. And, uh, and from what I recall, the, the, uh, this was unplanned and I, I don't have a reference and I read it years ago, but from what I recall, the uh, the rock music resulted in uh, less growth. The plants did not do as well. They were not as healthy. Right, and right. Uh, yeah, I've heard Beethoven, the same thing. Yeah, and Beethoven and Vivaldi, the plants grew better. They were healthier. Anyway. So there could be a few reasons for that. Number one, it could just be that the music's bad and causing plants to die. There's also um, some people who took tomatoes over in China and they put hyperbaric CO2 in the roots of the plants and they grew a lot bigger. But mm-hmm. there's also some people who played high pitched noises to corn, not to the corn music group, but to corn. Like it sounded like, like the same frequencies that birds sing in the morning. He replicated that and played it to the corn just Mm -hmm. random and that caused the stomata to open up and then the corn grew taller and higher and bigger and all that kind of stuff so yeah the sounds it's for sure yeah and we can assume things about it but it could have been some something like you know maybe the rock was pitched lower or higher than the classical music the pitch or the frequency you mentioned syncopation the beat yep yeah it could be yeah that's right that's right there's a lot of of things that go there's melody, rhythm, and harmony, and dynamics when you have music. So it could be any one of those things. Um, yeah, I like Roberta's joke, too. Pretty wild. Had to be corn, the only plant with ears. That's a, that's a good dad <laughs> joke right there. <laughs> and then the, the potatoes probably saw it, too. Uh, yeah. I kind of feel the same way about uh, yoga, like Christians practicing yoga. Like, where, do, where does it stem from, you know? What are the roots? Where does it come from? What do you open? stuff up to you want to well, open six chakra and get demon possessed well well that would be a whole nother conversation in my opinion about is it possible to extrapolate a positive ecology of practices and separate them from uh ostensibly false propositions that have gone with that ecology of practices in the past <laughs> and james is saying no all right, so it is 8.30. Anybody got any burning thing they just have to say before we uh, cut it off for tonight? Keith's got, Keith's got one. Just remember, everyone, all your bodily organs are not vestigial. So just <laughs> contemplate. <laughs> I probably lost some life years by losing an organ there. No vestigial um, That's organ. all. <laughs> no, I just I just hope you're healing healing well. And I welcome to the club. 
And then uh, one more, I want to make one comment to Scott, if you could, that book that you mentioned about rock music, if maybe if you could send me an email with the author and title, and then I can uh, blast that out in an email to everyone who was, who was in this video. That way everybody can get a copy of that if they wanted to. Yeah. And, and I, Joe here might be able to send you something on that. All right. But sounds I, good. I don't guarantee it. And then I'll post that. I'll post that under the notes section whenever on the FSI page under this zoom link video, things that were mentioned in this video, I'll post links to that kind of stuff there where people can get to it. All right. Um, thanks everybody for, uh, for dialing in on zoom. I really appreciate all you guys. Uh, you, you mean a lot to me by being here and, uh, I feel very edified by y'all's comments and questions and interaction. And I look forward, um, next week, my wife and I, our honeymooning. So, All right. Yeah, you guys have a great time, man. We will not be having a Zoom next Wednesday. <laughs> we will do a Sunday, and then we pro we won't do a following Sunday either. So we are taking a week. We wanted to get uh, you know earlier, but COVID and everything. We just at the point where we can travel again. So we're trying to take advantage of that. We're going to be gone for about a week from the 21st to the 28th. And then uh, we'll do this coming Sunday, and then we'll pick up the f not the following Sunday, but the one after that, right around the beginning of November, end of October, right around Halloween or All Saints Day, whatever that is. All right. Uh, have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Bye, everybody.